Um, so I got involved really as a Catholic youth trainer um, starting in 2018, um, and it was just one of the best experiences. I was um, here, you can see I was at Forum, if you guys were there, um, with Su Thao and um, then CEO, uh, 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 the general right there. And it was just such an amazing experience. And um, I won't bore you by going through my background again, but um, I guess the only other addition is that I've been a CADCA youth trainer since about 2019. 2018 was my first experience with CADCA at their mid-year conference in Orlando, Florida, um, which I know that was just the uh, location that was held at. And um, it was so great. And I know all of you, um, if you have youth or if you don't have youth, just getting to go to one of the CADCA conferences has been one of the highlights of my year. And so um, I know it's the highlight of so many other people's years too. And so I'm excited to give this training and to be speaking with all of you virtually. Um, so why don't we get started? Um, the next slide is when it all begins. Okay, so really there are two goals and um, that I want to accomplish for today. First is really just understanding what public policy is. You know, we hear public policy in that term a lot. And so we want to break it down and hopefully make it a little bit more understandable for you, your coalition members. And then the second part is looking at understanding where a coalition and you specifically fit into public policy. So how can young people, how can coalition members really make public policy happen? And so we'll be talking about some of the avenues for change, how to strategize better, how to look at lobbying. So all of these different things that make public policy ultimately come to fruition and a success. And then, and then at the end, we'll get into some questions and answers. Hopefully, uh, we can have some Q&A and some dialogue at the end rather than you listening to just my voice for the entire hour. Next slide, please. Okay, so I just want to get started off with some headlines that I looked up recently. So here were just some of the things I saw recently that got passed. Um, as you can see, you probably have read this on the news, but on the lower left, or I guess in the middle left, you see uh, the Bipartisan Saver Communities Act, which is this gun law. You see uh, on the uh, lower right, the uh, $52 billion CHIPS Act, uh, which advances science and progress. And then uh, at the top right, you see the Inflation Reduction Act, which includes a series of different provisions that would address things like climate change and healthcare. And these are all things what we call public policy, right? So when you see these things in the news or when you see headlines like this, these are all public policy because they, they deal with laws. And um, the next slide, if you can turn to the next slide, um, shows you what public policy, uh, the definition of public policy when you look it up on the internet. So just a quick Google search, and you'll see that the first definition that comes up um, for public policy is the principles often unwritten on which social laws are based. And really, these are just the, the things that get passed either through legislation, in Congress, um, sometimes deal with legal processes, but these are things that affect our daily lives, whether it be, you know, someone affecting the, uh, you know, roads that you drive on at home, fixing the local potholes, or just, you know, uh, looking at um, climate change and, and trying to address that. But really, any policy uh, that affects your life can be deemed as public policy. They can be written, unwritten, anything that affects your life. Next slide, please. So a good way to think about public policy is by thinking about a structure called problem cause solution. So usually when you kind of deal with public policy or when you hear public policy, it's about looking at a problem in your community. So let's say I'm from Chicago, you look at a problem like drug usage. Okay, so we're all here at CADCAN and the one thing that unites us is trying to make our community safer and healthier and drug free. So that can be kind of the overarching problem. And then what you deal with public policy then is you locate the causes of at that problem. So, right, you have the problem of drug violence or drug drug usage, and you look at what causes uh, contribute to that problem. And then lastly, you try to find solutions to address that problem. So you can think of public policy as looking to find a problem in your community and then trying to look at the causes that contribute to that problem and then finding solutions to amend or solve that problem. So you can think of public policy in kind of that nutshell as problem cause solution. So here are just some examples of all the different kind of drug, uh, kind of public policies that you kind of see in your community or you see uh, in the nation. Um, you have everything from education to policing to environment to voting rights to healthcare economy. 
transportation, infrastructure, safety, and then of course, drug policy. But all of these different kind of buckets of public policy all deal with some sort of problem, like we said. It deals with a question. So for example, education, should we have more public or private schools? Or should uh, who should be funding them? Should we forgive student loans? So all of them deal with this kind of overarching problem. And then with public policy, you look at what caused those problems, and then how can we amend those problems by looking at a solution? So here you can see there's a, just a wide breadth of different public policies you can address. But here at CADCA, what we do is we look at drug policies, and we look at how to make our communities safer and healthier and drug-free. Okay, so how to think about public policy. We, so we know that at its core, it's about looking at a problem, finding a cause, and then uh, finding a solution to address that problem. But in order to really grasp public policy and understand how we can uh, address in the best way, we really have to understand how government functions. So we're, this isn't going to be your typical civics class, your typical government class, but we do want to just do a little bit of a civics 101 lesson. So um, I've arrange the next slide to look somewhat like how the federal structure, how the federal government is uh, structured. And so um, if you can turn to the next slide. So you have these three different buildings. And as you can see, these are probably quite familiar to all of you. On the top, you have Congress. On the In the middle, you have the White House. And then uh, on the bottom, you have uh, the Supreme Court. And each one of them, as you know, represents a different uh, structure of government. So the top represents the legislative component of the government. The middle represents the executive portion of the government. And then the lower picture represents the judicial um, part of the government. And you may have learned this in your government class or if we have any um, young people out there, maybe you are about to learn this, but really public policy it deals with uh, these three branches of government and mostly Congress. So let's just start from the top. So at the top, you have this legislative body. It has 535 members in it, um, 100 senators, two from each state. Um, each of them serve a six-year term. And then in the other house, you have the, the 435 members of uh, the House of Representatives, and each of them serve two-year terms. So you'll most likely have two senators in your state and um, a wide array of representatives, depending on which state you live in. If you live in um, Puerto Rico or maybe D.C., that might be a different case. Um, but most people have senators and representatives that elect them and then go to Congress, and their purpose is to propose and pass a wide series of laws. And in the middle, you have the legislative, uh, sorry, the executive branch, and that is composed of one president. Uh, he uh, or she is elected for four year terms, a maximum of eight year terms, so you can serve two terms. There's one vice president and then a varied amount of uh, cabinet level officials. So sometimes you would see uh, the Justice Department or the Treasury or, um, you know, Commerce Department. Those are all cabinet level officials that serve under the executive branch. And for example, uh, one kind of area of the executive branch that is quite relevant to CADCA is ONDCP, the Office of National Drug Control Policy, and they deal specifically with drug policy and drug use. And the purpose of the executive branch is to really enforce laws and uh, make sure that those laws happen. And then on the bottom, you have uh, the, ju the judicial branch, and this deals with the Supreme Court. So you have nine Supreme Court justices nominated by the president, and they serve for life. And the purpose of that is to interpret law. And that's usually the part of the government that you probably have least influence over because it's nine justices ultimately making that uh, decision. Next slide, please. But what you do have a huge role in is the legislative branch, so Congress. And so understanding how Congress works is essential. So you can think of it really in four steps. So usually a bill gets introduced by a member of Congress, either in the Senate or House. One of them sponsors that bill, and then it goes into a phase called committee. So then the proposed bill is assigned to a committee. They do some research, they propose, and then it goes into debate. So the bill goes to the House or Senate floor for debate. Members of Congress can propose um, changes, can propose provisions. They can, you know, ask for something to get taken out, something to get added in. But that's where kind of the the whole uh, process and and uh, uh, kind of uh, way that the government functions really happens. It's through that debate part. 
And then at the end, once you debate, then it goes back to both member, both houses of Congress, and then they take a vote. If it passes, then it goes to the president. But really, this is where we as advocates and we as coalition members can have the most sways by looking up our senators, looking up our House of Representatives, and really trying to sway them and educate them on the issues that are most important to us. So having some sort of understanding of how Congress works and this legislative branch and how a bill kind of moves through is really critical. Next step, or next slide. And this isn't just for the federal level. So a lot of the times you'll see news headlines and, and things in the media that focus specifically on the legislative branch in DC. So you think of Congress and you think of you know really high profile members of Congress, but there are multiple levels of government. So you have the federal level of government, you have the state level of government, and then you also have the local level of government. And each of them serve a very distinct role, but the structures of government kind of follow throughout. So in your state, you probably also have a legislative, executive, and judicial role, and then same in your uh, local area. And so it just depends as you kind of think through how to affect public policy, which level of uh, the government you want to start at. Is it federal level? Is it the state level? Or is it the local level? And no matter where you start, you have a big impact. So it's kind of useful to think of uh, public policy split among the various levels of government. Okay, so with a better understanding of government, now I think it's useful to kind of go back to that problem cause solution framework and identify a problem in your community. So um, maybe after this presentation or maybe uh, when you rewatch the program, uh, look at how you can identify a problem in your community. So for example, it can be drug policy. So something like underage drinking, the usage of vapes or marijuana consumption. So really trying to look at the problem in your community your state and trying to address that. And then that will be the basis for the policy that you end up creating. Next slide, please. And you can really think of identifying um, the causes then in two different tracks. So looking at, you know, why is this problem in my community? You can think of it either qualitatively or quantitatively. So the qualitative track is really looking at, you know, really uh, uh, kind of stories, right? So these are so these are data points, these are stories, these are um, things that you can see in your community and things that might maybe, um, you know, a, a young person has told you, maybe someone has testified, but this is someone who can really testify to the problem that's going on in your community. The other hand, you have quantitative data, and this is really looking at hard numbers. So maybe doing surveys, maybe looking at uh, various uh, polls. So these are things that you can tangi tangibly point to that contribute to the problem in your community. So you have all these different kind of avenues of looking at why this is happening in my community and looking at the causes. And these are the kind of the two tracks you can go down, either qualitatively looking at stories and looking at what people have said, and then quantitatively looking at the hard numbers and hard evidence. Next slide, please. So we always want to make data compelling. And so when you think through either whether or not you want to go down the qualitative route or the quantitative route, you can think through some of these questions. So how long has it been a problem? Has it been a problem for a long time or has it been a problem just recently? And some of the data you can really convey to make it you know, speak to that. So if you find some of uh, qualitative data, you know, how far are people, you know, have people been saying this? Does it go back to, you know, the 1900s or is this more recent? So we're looking at, you know, how long has this story been a problem and how long have people said that? Uh, if you look at the quantitative kind of track, you know, how much does the data support it? So does the data support underage drinking, you know, for decades or is this more of a recent problem? And then you shape your data to fit that narrative. Something you also want to look at is sample size. So if you look at the qualitative route, right, how many people are actually saying this or confirming that this is a problem in my community? How many people were surveyed? How many people are saying this? If you're looking at the quantitative route, right, looking at, you know, how many people have, you know, contributed to a poll or what is, what is, how many polls are out there? So really looking at, you know, strengthening your argument by looking at the sample size, right? Numbers speak volumes uh, when it comes to data. And looking at, at assumptions. So what are some of the assumptions that maybe a poll or that someone uh, you know, might come up with? Are there any leaps in logic? What are the assumptions that might be uh, in your poll? And try to identify them so that you can strengthen your argument. And then lastly, um, are they easily refutable? What does the other side think? So always making sure to look at the other side and what they think. But kind of thinking through these questions will make your data, whether qualitative or quantitative, uh, more compelling in the long run. Next slide, please. 
Okay, and then lastly, solution. So here at CADCA, we think through uh, seven different ways that you can really create community level change and um, solve some of the problems in your community. Obviously, these aren't all of the different avenues, but we kind of like to think of it uh, in these seven different buckets. So the first is providing information. So this is all about educating people and really providing ways to address the problem in your community. So whether it be through pamphlets or different town halls, but really providing information to make people more aware of the thing that has happened in your community. Next, you have enhancing skills. So this is uh, kind of deals with the second and third bullet point, providing support, but really trying to give your community members uh, the skills necessary to solve the problem or to address the solution at hand. So, you know, looking at, um, you know, leaflets or, or, or doing webinars or doing trainings, but these are all about enhancing skills. So, for example, my uh, coalition uh, in Chicago, we would do weekly lunch and learns with teachers and give teachers uh, the support that they needed to identify something, for example, like um, how to detect a student using vape pens or how to detect uh, or how to deal with um, someone who comes from a family where uh, drinking might be a very heavy problem. So really providing that support and enhancing those skills among either students, community members, parents, uh, teachers, and giving them that support that they need to ultimately tackle that problem. And then you have enhancing or reducing barriers. So this can be something like, you know, looking at what is contributing to underage drinking. Is it a local shop? Is it, you know, um, a, a, you know, a marijuana dispensary and trying to reduce the barriers to get there. So maybe it's, you know, requiring that people have to card underage people, making sure that you, you follow certain steps in order to access that product. Um, but really trying to enhance or reduce the barriers. And this also kind of goes with uh, bullet number five, which is really promoting incentives and disincentives, right? So you either want to promote, you know, healthier and safer lives and then disincentivize um, uh, some more dangerous activity like drug use. So looking at how you can kind of amend the different consequences in your community. The sixth bullet point is changing the physical design of your community, right? So looking at ways that you can support community level engagement, really uniting people. So a lot of the times, for example, some people might build something like a billboard where you just have a simple message, but people can see it when they drive past it. Um, another example is just creating more parks and green spaces. And that can be a way where people, instead of, you know, engaging in drug activity, can just go to the park and, and, and spend some good time with their friends. So really trying to think of the physical design that contributes to your problem and then trying to build um, some more favorable physical designs. And then lastly is modifying and changing policy. So we'll get more into this later on in the webinar, but this is all about looking at your representatives and looking at your elected officials and trying to change policies by going to them uh, and going to your local and state and federal level officials to uh, affect policy change. So these are kind of the seven different buckets that we here at CAD could like to use. But like I said before, these aren't all of them. And by far, um, I'm sure all of you have some uh, additional uh, ways that you can solve the problem in your community. Next slide, please. Okay, so now that we have a little bit, hopefully, of a better understanding of uh, public policy and what that entails, right, looking at a problem, identifying a cause, and then hopefully finding a solution to address that, now this is all about application. So this is where part two comes in and where you fit in as coalition members and where you fit in as young people. So we're really going to look at um, how you and your coalition can become a better advocate and strategist in passing public policy and ultimately seeing success in the things that you advocate for. Next slide, please. So to begin with this, I have two clips, and uh, this is these are from uh, a movie called Miss Sloan. Um, just as a precursor, uh, it gets a little bit dramatic, so this isn't real life at all, but it is a nice way to just kind of think about strategy and, and, and foresight and how um, we can we can think through those and kind of foreground the conversation uh, to come. So I'm going to play two clips. One is an ad, and another is a very short uh, clip from uh, one of the scenes from Miss Sloan, and then uh, we'll reconvene at the uh, after them. Oh, so I'm not sure. Maybe um, I can pull up my screen, and then I have the original videos if that's um, helpful. Okay, um, let me pull up my screen. Share. Okay, so I just got a new computer. Oh, actually, it seems like you guys have it up, right? 
but I'm not hearing any sound. Anticipating your opponent's moves. Lobbying is about foresight, but anticipating your opponent's moves. She's your enemy now. And devising countermeasures. How the hell did she manage that? You're a piece of work, Elizabeth. I was hired to win. I use whatever resource I have. Who the hell does she think she is? There's over five million of us, and we're armed. Sorry, I've been in position. They will throw you in jail for contempt of Congress. Winner, thoughts one step ahead of the opposition. We have to make it personal. You know the word annihilate. It means reduced to nothing. This is more important than my career. It's mind boggling. You cross the line. Genius. Bugging and tapping. It's about making sure you surprise them and they don't surprise you. Miss Sloan, Ridded R. Sorry, I think I was on mute, but that was a bit dramatic, but we have one more clip after that, um, just from a scene from Ms. Sloan, and then we'll reconvene uh, right after that. What's the best indicator of voter intention? $9. That's our first prong. Grassroots action aimed squarely at soliciting donations, not names on a petition, not clicks in cyberspace. Well, they know how much we're raising? Nonprofits have to report on their finances. And every congressional staffer watches finding day like a hawk. While you're out there hustling, I'll be working influential senators who can deliver their colleagues votes. That's our second prong. Our third is to identify who will sway in target states. Employers, workers groups. Don't just waltz into a senator's office and make your case. Find out who they trust, who they can't afford to piss off. Convince that person to make your case. That is how we win. Awesome, thank you for playing those. Um, so these were two examples, again, from Miss Sloan, and um, this is a movie that just deals with a lot of different, you know, pol public policy and um, uh, is, a, is, I think, a good kind of way to frame the discussion about how you can become a better strategist. And just one really important note, um, we'll be talking about lobbying after this, but one of the things they say in the clip is lobbying. And um, if you are a drug-free community member, um, you may not lobby, you can only educate. So just keeping that in mind. But um, I went through and I listened to some key words or, or some key phrases for from uh, those two clips. And some of them are really, really um, important for our conversation. So um, here are some of them. So um, sh uh, she mentioned foresight, anticipating your opponent's moves, advising countermeasures, using resources, um, making sure that the winner always plots one step ahead of the opposition, um, making sure that you surprise them and they don't surprise you. So that was kind of from that first uh, uh, kind of just add for the movie. And then for the clip uh, from the movie, you had uh, grassroots action, working influential senators, identifying who holds sway, and then just not waltzing into a senator's office and making your case, really finding out who they trust, who they can afford to piss off doing your research. So, so those are some of the things that the movie has said. And so we're going to use that as kind of a framework to look at how you can become a better strategist and really affect change in your community and become the best advocates as possible as young people, as coalition members. Next slide, please. Okay, so let's think about strategy and this word strategy and public policy. Um, so if you do a quick Google search again, um, you'll see that strategy can be defined as a plan of action or policy designed to achieve a major overall aim. And really it's just about, you know, looking at something and then looking about how that can come to fruition and thinking through the different processes and um, steps to get there. Next step, please, or next slide, please. Okay, but here's one caveat. So when we think about strategy and public policy, it's not just getting about from A to B, although that's a lot about what strategy is about, right? Getting from A to B, and you know, if A is kind of where you start and B is the end result, you obviously want to reach B. But next slide. What happens in public policy is that you'll often uh, 
expect or you often will encounter some unexpected roadblocks. So these are, you know, things that maybe your opposition says, maybe these are things, you know, things that refute your argument, but these are all things that make it a little bit more challenging to make public policy come to fruition. And as a strategist, it's about, about it's on you to really think about those different components and some of those unexpected roadblocks and find the best way to get from A to B. So next slide um, really shows, you know, if you want to get to A to B with these roadblocks, how can you take the best way to get there? So here are just two ways, but there are multiple ways or, or numerous ways to get from A to B when you have roadblocks, but it's about thinking through that process in order to achieve that outcome. So really kind of thinking through, okay, I want to get to the end result. I know that there will be things along the way, but as a good strategist and as a good advocate, you'll expect those things and then you can uh, get to A to B in the best way possible. So that's kind of a nutshell of what strategy is about. Next slide, please. So Strategy, like I said, the outcome is the same, right? It's about winning, but the process is really what matters in strategy. You want to think about the individual steps that help you get there, thinking through the various advantages and disadvantages that come with each step. And that requires not only strategy, but also one of the words that you heard in the clip, which is foresight and or forethought. And so um, next slide deals with this term a little bit more. So foresight, you can think of it kind of as like a game of chess. So anyone who is a chess player who has seen a game of chess know that you always have to kind of how, you know, she said it in the clip, plot one step ahead of the opposition, right? So if you are a chess player, you always want to be thinking about your opponent's moves. And it's the same thing with public policy, right? If you are advocating for drug, uh, healthier and safer communities of drug uh, use, right, you really want to make sure that you know what the other side is thinking and then address their points. So it involves an opponent. Consider what your power leverage is. Is it a student? Is it a community member? Is it a parent? Really think through what makes you uh, uh, come to the table and what makes you um, swayable for the person that you're talking to. Um, what is in your power? What is in your favor? Is it a recent win? Is it, for example, maybe you're in your community, you had a win to you know, ban e-cigarettes? Um, is it a poll that's in your favor? Really thinking about what's in your power. Um, what isn't in your power or in favor? And then how do you respond to that? And then lastly, in public policy, it's always really important to take advantage of your strengths because the end goal is to win. So if you really use your strengths and then know how to best uh, uh, target the opposition, that's really what foresight is, right? Looking at your strengths and then looking at the opposition and then knowing and expecting what they're gonna say. Next slide, please. Okay, so here are some strategy steps. Uh, you can take a screenshot of this or just later when you um, rewatch re this. So how exactly will I know when I win? Is it, you know, accomplishing maybe a small thing like, you know, getting a poll done and, and having another data point, right? Having a quantitative data. Is it, you know, maybe selling a message or getting some sort of uh, media interview out there? Or is it ultimately to win, right? If you're working on a bill, um, you know, is it passing that bill? Or is it something even smaller, like maybe just getting, uh, a senator to back you and, and back your uh, case, right? But thinking about what constitutes a win. Um, what power and resources do I have right now? So, right, kind of going back to what I said earlier, um, what do I have that's in my favor right now? Uh, looking at what or who is in my opposition, right? So is it, for example, when we're, go when we're talking about tobacco and trying to limit tobacco use, it's probably pig the big tobacco uh, uh, industry, right? So looking at them and what they're saying and always uh, refuting that. How will I use timing to my advantage, right? A lot of the times timing is critical, right? So for example, in Congress, they always have uh, times where they're in session and times where they're out of session. So how can you use that to your advantage? And then what are your first two steps, right? Don't think about what you're going to do a year from now, although that can be helpful just to have a kind of a general sense, but really think about your first two steps, making that tangible, making that as clear and as detailed and as specific as possible. And then that will be your launching off point to ultimately achieving success in your community. So those are some steps you can think through as you uh, start to uh, make public policy real in your community. Next slide, please. Okay, so then we're going to apply it to the levels of change, right? So we all now at this point, we know what public policy is. Uh, you should have identified the problem in your community, the causes, the solutions. And now you kind of are thinking about, okay, well, how do I become the best strategist? And how can I use foresight to really make this the most effective as possible? And now this is kind of the last step and thinking about how can I make public policy really come to fruition. And so we have five different levels of um, organizing or strategy that we can use. And here is a cute little graphic that I found, you know, don't panic organize. And so here are the five different ways that you can organize. The first is co community coalition building. 
The second is civic advocacy. The third is lobbying. The fourth is grassroots demonstrating. And then the fifth is civil disobedience. And then we'll get into each one of those um, right now. So let's get into the first one, which is community coalition building. So what makes CADCA so special, as you all know, is that we are all a part of a coalition, right? So I'm a part of a coalition called Stand Strong Coalition in Vernon Hills. I'm sure all of you are part of a coalition somewhere in your community or in your state. And really, as you know, a coalition is this alliance of groups really formed to oppose a common foe and then work toward a common goal, right? So we are all opposed to drug usage, to underage drinking, to tobacco usage, to marijuana usage, and we all want to see a healthier community free of those, right? So a healthier community that strives for responsible drug consumption, for not underage drinking, for not marijuana consumption, right? So we're all united around that one goal. And so we oppose something together and we also work to something together. And so there's really a lot of power in us coming together um, as a coalition uh, and as coalition members. And in order to be a part of a coalition, as you all probably are well aware of, you need solid leadership, you need to have a clear intention, and you all and we all work together to achieve a goal. Next slide, please. So here I have an example of um, something that I was a part of in high school. Um, so this was kind of a uh, uh, fell right underneath the umbrella Stand Strong Coalition. So Stand Strong Coalition was the umbrella coalition, and then what uh, the the student section of Stand Strong Coalition was a high school club called Catalyst. And so this was kind of its own little coalition, but just of high school members. And um, this is a pretty old photo of uh, all the members in this uh, little student coalition. But we had all these different communities and different kind of sectors in this coalition. So we had a specific policy committee. We had some community outreach. We had some community youth, youth activism. We had a marijuana legislative committee and a parent committee. But really, all of these kind of different components, right, you, these are all distinct components. But at the end of the day, we come together to uh, promote health healthier and safer communities free of drug use. Next slide, please. Okay, so we went through community coalition building. Next, we have civic advocacy. So this is really where, um, you know, anyone can use this, but especially for DFC members, this is um, what you'll be doing uh, rather than lobbying, which we'll get to next. So civic advocacy is working with legislatures and lawmakers, either on the federal, state, or local level to create change. So, um, this requires good communication skills and research. Um, you focus on challenging or changing existing laws. So at the end of the day, civic advocacy is about educating and informing your elected officials and your representatives about the issue at hand. So using that as a leverage and as a tool to affect public policy. And then you begin to build those relationships and build those um, uh, connections with your state legislature. But at the end of the day, it's about educating and informing your state legislature. Next slide, please. On the other hand, lobbying is about advancing a specific policy agenda through the legislative process. And this usually demands something like, will you support this bill? Or can I count on your support? Or will you vote for this issue? So this is usually a direct ask rather than educating. So civic advocacy is all about informing and providing pamphlets and providing materials for your um, uh, uh, legislative uh, official. But this is really going to the next step. So lobbying is going to the next step and asking whether or not they will support something. And this really requires a knowledge about how laws are made, it's usually focused on creating new laws or enforcement measures, and this usually involves direct communication with legislators or legislative staff. So remember, if you're a DFC member, you can only educate and inform, and that kind of falls under the civic advocacy umbrella. And if you're not a DFC member, you can engage in lobbying, and that usually involves that direct ask and really having a more direct role in advancing a specific legislative or policy agenda. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is grassroots demonstrations. This was something that was mentioned also in the Miss Sloan uh, video clip, but this is something that we've seen a lot, especially in recent uh, months or recent years. So this is using the power of large groups, right? Numbers speak volumes in both data, but also in politics and in movements to force or pressure those in power. So some examples that I'm sure you can all think of that we've seen recently, right? You had the, at the beginning of the Trump administration, you had the Women's March where uh, women across the country came out in support uh, and really defended women's rights. You had the climate change one led by Greta Thunberg. You have the Black Lives Matter protests, but all of these are massive movements and grassroots demonstration that require just your ordinary people coming together and marching on the streets and really making their voice heard through protests and grassroots 
grassroots demonstrations. Um, often this is about addressing the entire system at large rather than specific policies, right? So you really no, never hear, okay, well, I'm going to go protest about this specific bill. Usually it's about more a bigger issue. So think about the gun reform community. They usually protest on that big issue of just gun reform and gun legislation rather than a specific bill. Um, this is a more confrontational method, right? You usually get on the streets and you make your voice heard. Um, and this is best done when you uh, uh, when the demonstrations are coordinated simultane simultaneously, right? So often when you see those mass movements, you'll see not only just one big movement, but you'll see all these different movements in different states and local communities throughout the country. And usually those are all communicated or communicated or funneled to the top of the movement. Next slide, please. Okay, and next is civil disobedience. So this uh, really kind of goes back uh, to some history, right? So think about the uh, civil rights movement and what some of those people engaged in. Uh, this is really refusal to obey or um, follow unjust and immoral laws. This appeals to one sense of justice, and this is all about open, nonviolent, and public uh, confrontational methods of making your voice heard. So, um, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. really kind of personified what civil disobedience, disobedience meant, but this is really looking at, you know, this system that is unjust and immoral and really kind of using the most confrontational and direct method as possible to make your voice heard. Um, and so this is uh, another avenue that you can create change and really the fifth and final avenue um, to, to organize. Next slide, please. Okay, so we went through a wide range, a wide array of things today, um, right? We should have a better understanding of what public policy is, um, what it entails, right? Looking at a problem in our community, identifying the causes of that problem, and then finding a solution to that problem, and then understanding your role in this process, right? So as young people, as community level, as community member coalitions, looking at where you fall in this process of affecting change and affecting public policy, right? So looking at how you can become a better advocate and better strategist and really use, utilizing those different levels of organizing in the best way possible in your community. So um, here's the last slide, but it's really knowing, you know, how are you going to use your voice, right? Here at CADCA, we have uh, people of all ages. We have people young. We have people in the middle. We have people on the far end. We have people from all political backgrounds, from all stripes, from all races, and we all come together to unite to, to really promote safer and healthier communities. So knowing how public policy works, knowing how you can become a better advocate, how are you going to use your voice? And, you know, um, both myself and both everyone uh, uh, in the youth leadership program really embodies just the power that youth voices have. So if we, there are any uh, young people out there listening to this, my challenge is, is to you, you know, you have power in your voice. How are you going to use your voice now with a better understanding of public policy, with a better understanding of how you can become a better advocate? So um, hopefully you leave this session with a little bit of a better understanding of what this is and how you can take this into your community. And um, maybe now we can do some questions and answers uh, with your um, uh, with some of the audience members. So I think there's a Q and A function in the uh, bottom uh, of your screen. So if you have any questions, feel free to shoot them over, and we can address them in the 15 minutes remaining. Um, but thank you so much for coming to this. All right, thank you so much, Victor, for that. Yeah, everybody, start sending your questions. Hopefully, if you have those. Um, that was an amazing presentation. And someone said, will you be sending the slide presentation now? I believe that will be um, available on the website. So somebody put the website up there, the webinar Wednesdays. I believe it'll be up there. But yeah, thank you very much, Victor. Okay. Really quickly, before we get into any questions, uh, I am just going to put the advocacy toolkit online in the chat because we do have a lot more people here than we did at the beginning. So um, for everybody who was not here at the very beginning, we have a new advocacy toolkit from CADCA, which is about a lot of the things Victor shared in the presentation. So that is linked right here in the chat. So feel free to do that if you wanna learn more. All right, we'll get to some questions. Okay, so we have a question. 
question says right here, we are having issues with student engagement. Any ideas, Victor, what do you say to that? Yeah, so um, I, I see Sarah sent that. Um, I wish we could have like a dialogue here, but in terms of student engagement, I mean, that's one of the things, right? Um, just getting young people involved in politics, that's something that I think about a lot. And I think if you're having any issues with student engagement, I would say really look to where young people are, right? So one of the things that um, people often say, politics or people often say in the organizing spaces, meet people where they are. So look at kind of the areas where young people are involved most. Um, so in a community that can be a school, right? So looking at elementary, middle school, high schools, colleges, and then forming partnerships in that way. Um, that's where young people are in kind of most kind of concentrated. And so looking where they are and then meeting them where they are and providing that information to them. Um, and then I'd say, you know, if, if that's not an option, uh, taking to social media is a great way, right? So young people are really involved in social media. They are, uh, Gen Z is the most connected on social media. I think more than 95% of us um, use more than one platform. So looking at that avenue to reach young, young people and, and promoting your information that way. But I'd say probably the easiest place to start off is just by looking at your schools, trying to form partnerships with the school um, administrators, maybe principals, um, educators, and then looking at ways to engage students that way. Hopefully that um, answers some of your, that question. All right, thank you. Um, our next question is, how do we educate and engage youth in advocacy work? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. So I would say one of the best ways to, to engage young people in advocacy work um, kind of goes back to what we said about, right, the federal, state, and local levels. A lot of the time, I think we think in big terms, right? We think about, okay, how can we make this happen on the national scale? But one of the best ways to engage young people is just to start local. So look at something that's happening in your school district or in your community, and then give the young person that you're talking to some sort of um, idea for how they can create change. So it can be a small as just you know, making a phone call. It can be as small as just creating an infographic or as big as creating a partnership with an elected official and going to a meeting and, and making their voice heard. But really starting small and using that kind of avenue in your community is a great way to engage young people because then young people kind of see it directly in their eyes, right? So you see it happening up front, up close, and then giving young people just options about how they can get involved. And then the earlier you can start them in that process and the more they can visualize it and imagine it, the better I think it ultimately come, becomes in sustaining youth engagement and getting young people to become excited about um, changing something in their community. All right, and next question is, just for clarification, DFC staff members cannot lobby but can coalition members lobby? So it so it's it's a good question, and um, if there are any CADCA members, feel free to jump in um, in the chat box if I'm mistaking this. But DFC funds coalitions, and so if you are a part of co a coalition that um, receives DFC money, under no circumstance can you actually lobby. So um, you can only engage in what we in the presentation called civic advocacy. So really, just educating and promoting um, information about that issue. But if your coalition receives funding, then I don't think any coalition member can actually engage in lobbying. Um, and I see, um, I don't know, if, I think I saw Chris Dorn in the chat. Um, Correct me if I'm wrong, but I, like usually DF funding goes to coalition members. And if you're part of that coalition, then you cannot um, lobby, but you can lobby so, coalition members. So, uh, Victor, you can yes. lobby as a um, as an individual, as not as a coalition member, but as a as Victor Shi from sure. Illinois, you know, if that makes sense. Thank you. Awesome. Chris. Thank you, Chris. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yet it's um, I would like to emphasize that. So that right here, they actually have in the toolkit about that. Um, Victor was exactly right. If you receive those sort of fundings, you can't lobby, but you can lobby as yourself individually, but not as an active member of the group. You can be an active member and still lobby individually, but you have to make sure that there's a clear distinction from that as your job and that as you being an individual. Okay, and we have a question from Erica that says, can you talk a little more about factors that help get youth inspired to be involved? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and I, I would say, I mean, in terms of getting youth involved and kind of goes back to my other question. So one really important avenue is just right starting local and looking at the different ways that 
young people can get involved in you know their community, but also I would say forming a lot of those um, intergenerational dynamics. So right, if you're an adult and if you're working with young people, really really letting them have a seat at the table, giving them a voice and giving them a platform to work on things, to make their voice heard. And I think the more kind of partnerships and more kind of mentorship or sponsorship activities that can happen between adults and young people are really critical. So if you're an adult, if you're a coalition member who, you know, it can be, you know, you're just uh, a member of that coalition, or you can, if you're like a leadership in that, if you have a leadership position in that coalition, and if you know a young person, really think about them, right? Think, have them at the forefront of your mind and then give them the opportunity again, and then give them that kind of space to grow. But I would say kind of promoting those connections between, you know, coalition members, adults, and then also students and young people is a really good way to get young people involved. Because I think a lot of the times young people don't get involved because they don't know that there's actually an option to get involved. So making that option to young people and making that um, a possibility, I think goes a long way. So the more kind of partnerships adults and young people can have, I think um, is strong. Strong and, and that's why I love this CADCA um, uh, youth department and youth training section is because we do foster those um, dynamic, those kind of connections and collaborations between adult members of the coalition, but also young people of the coalition and getting them to work together to achieve something. Thank you. Um, I like this question. Uh, any guidance for youth who are proposing a meeting with an, with an elected official? Yeah, it's a great question. So um, one of the things that um, I was told really early on is um, young people have a lot of power. And I thought it was very, you know, cheesy and very just kind of cliche, but it's not a lie at all. So young people have tremendous power. There's something that when you're an elected official, when you see a young person come to the table and make their voice heard, they automatically have a lot more respect for the young person than still adults. And that's with as much respect as possible for the adult coalition members. But there's just something about young people that resonate with uh, elected officials. Um, and so I'd say if you're if an elect if a young person if maybe it's he or she or maybe it's um, you know their first time going to an elected official and making their voice heard, um, really just starting off and doing the research, right? So looking at you know what's at stake, what's the issue at hand, doing some research on that end. Also, I think one of the most important ways for young people to feel comfortable at the table with an elected official is to really know their story, right? Be authentic, be genuine, be yourself. Understand why you're. A part of this work, what drives you to come to that table, and then never discounting um, uh, your voice. So, right, as a young person, it can be intimidating being at the same table as an elected official, but knowing that you have a seat at the table, you're there for a reason, and understanding what brings you to the table is really going to make ultimately your case or your conversation with elected official a lot more smoothing and hopefully a lot less intimidating. Oh, oh make it be that good. Awesome, and we have um, a raised hand from George Kaminsky. Sure. Uh, George. Sorry, that was an accident, but I was just thinking that I would love Victor to come to our community and talk to our youth. I would be delighted to. Thank you, George. All right, well, Let's see, we have a question from an anonymous viewer. Can you recommend fun training resources for youth to engage with this content? We have engaged youth who, have, who are interested, but there is not much to go over. The more fun it is, the better. Yeah, so that's one of the hardest challenges about um, honestly being a trainer is as someone who doesn't deem myself very creative, it's finding creative ways and fun ways to hopefully engage um, an audience and engage um, uh, young people. Um, Sadly, you know, uh, just talking to people and, 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 and you know, having, um, you know, someone come in and just do a lecture series doesn't really engage young people. Our attention spans are short. There isn't much to engage young people on that end. But I would say doing activities and getting young people moved is a great way. So doing some games, um, you know, uh, showing videos from, you know, movies that are up front in our lives, finding um, 
you know, memes and, and, and different way and different graphics to show up. That's a great way to engage young people, but really finding things that are entertaining and getting young people to move, right? So one of the ways that you can do this, for example, is if you're thinking about something like strategy, right? Maybe getting young people to stand up and talk to each other about, you know, how they would create strategy, right? Getting them moving, getting their blood flowing. Um, that's kind of one avenue to do so. Um, when we talk about incentives, right? Um, having some sort of uh, maybe gift card or prize um, for, for young people, uh, you know, they have something to look forward to after the presentation. That can be a great way to keep young people engaged and at the table. Um, looking at uh, fun YouTube videos or, or uh, young celebrities and using them as kind of the messenger, them as the example. But I would say just kind of looking at the, th the ways that young people engage, receive their information, um, and then trying to adapt whatever um, you're doing uh, to, to kind of match uh, young people in, in that way. All right, and thanks for that answer. I think that I hit another question of how do you get youth involved? So thank you for that. I actually have my own question real quick. Sure, yeah. So you talked about those uh, weekly luncheons with the teachers. I wanna know more about that. How did that go? Yeah, so really that was, so I was, like I said, I was a part of this club called uh, Catalyst and Catalyst does a lot of work uh, at the school. And so um, one year, uh, one of the members of Catalyst said, you know, wouldn't it be useful for teachers to know how all of this works? And so what we started doing is, so we reached out to the um, principal. And so he sent out a kind of, so he sends out these uh, semester, or I guess, um, usually every semester he sends out an, e an email to the teachers to inform them about a lunch and learn and any teacher that's interested can go to this lunch and learn and hear from catalyst and usually present on a wide array a wide rate of things so it can be on everything from you know underage drinking to tobacco usage to um you know how to detect vaping in the classrooms but really informing teachers because we thought that you know teachers are uh, they interact with students and if they're become more informed then they can detect some of these harmful and um uh, dangerous activities, and then hopefully be, be kind of that intermediary between the student and that activity and provide the support in the classroom. And so um, I would say if there's anyone out there looking to do these lunch and learns, reach out to your principal, reach out to uh, maybe whoever is in charge of all the teachers, and then work with them to uh, establish them. But it can honestly be even as simple as, you know, if you're a part, if you're a student, um, you know, talking to your teacher and then informing your teacher about that. And then maybe it can be a ripple effect. Your teacher knows about it and then your teacher kind of spreads the words uh, to uh, their colleagues. So um, it can happen in a wide array of things, but I definitely recommend doing some sort of lunch and learn with your teachers. All right. Thank you, Victor. That, sound, that sounds fascinating. I'm going to definitely let my teachers out that. Um, awesome. Well, awesome. So thank you very much, uh, everybody. Thank you so much for um, being here. And I just want a huge thank you to Victor. That was an amazing presentation. And you answered all those questions spot on. So thank you so much for being here today, Victor. Thank you. And if anyone has any questions, feel free to email um, victorshe2020 at gmail.com. So it's first and last name at 2020 and then at gmail.com and happy to answer any questions um, there. But thank you so much for watching this. And thank you, Scott, for a great moderation of this conversation and everyone at CADCA for coming. Of course. And I'd like to pass the time back over wonderful, our wonderful youth trainer, Jasmine. Awesome. Um, thank you again, Scott and Victor. If, Victor, if you can please drop your uh, email in the chat. Uh, so that people can become connected with you all. And if you are interested in having Victor at a training, please reach out to us and we um, can definitely make sure that we, we get him booked and busy and visiting you all in the different coalitions so that we can have more engaging conversation and in interactive space um, with our youth regarding policy prevention and other matters. Um, so thank you again. I'm going to pass it to Samantha to share some, some closing notes. But thank you again, Victor and Scott for moderating. Scott is one of our youth, actually again in our uh, National Youth Advisory Council, who is just beginning his first year of college as a political science major. And so it's great to see how our youth trainer, Victor, who is getting ready to graduate college soon and has done so much great work. Uh, Victor actually just finished an internship with the White House ONDCP. Uh, and so it's exciting to have him back. He's finishing up school and continuing to pass on the legacy with Scott uh, as a part of our youth team here and getting ready to engage in some of this work. So Samantha, the floor is yours. 
Thank you. It was a great presentation. I loved it. And just so the conversation doesn't stop here and just if anyone else has questions, I'm going to put in the chat again, if you would like to be a member of CATCA, if you want some more information on CATCA and becoming a member, the evaluation form is in there again. And just I know there was a few questions. Um, it will be posted this slideshow and any resources on our YouTube channel and of course on the CATCA website. So I'm going to put it in the in the chat box all again, but thank you all. It's a great presentation.